welcome back to another episode of Ballroom Chat. I'm your host, Samantha, with Love Live Dance. If you've not already done so, please do hit the subscribe button and turn on the bell for notifications so you get notified every time we post. Before we jump into today's episode, I'd also like to give a big thank you to our continuing supporters of this podcast, The Ballroom Box and The Girl with the Tree Tattoo. The holiday gift giving season is right around the corner, and now is the perfect time to go ahead and pre-order your holiday box. The Ballroom Box is offering a one-time purchase option, so if you don't want to subscribe to the full uh, annual plan, or if you want to give the teacher or student in your life uh, a one-time Christmas gift, you can do so. Uh, you can also select whether you want a more masculine box or a more feminine box. So it gives you more options to support the dancer in your life. We're also noticing that the weather is starting to get colder and colder. And if you're like me, motivation to leave the house starts to drop in the winter months. So for those of us that want to take our self practice or practicing at home to the next level, the solo practice guide is perfect for you. Katie Flashner uh, has written down her personal program for finding success, practicing on her own and along with other tips and tricks and a structure in mind, the solo practice guide is perfect for those of us that are gonna be spending a lot of time on our own this winter practicing and wanting to take our dance game to the next level. Links for both of those are in the description box below. And remember that your purchase of the ballroom box and the solo practice guide go to help supporting the podcast. So thank you in advance. Without further ado, let's get into today's episode. Uh, if you are a ballroom dancer in the U.S., you know that this week is Ohio Star Ball. And I had the incredible uh, pleasure of sitting down and getting to chat with the one and only Sam Sedano about the Ohio Star Ball, his dance background, and pretty much everything in between. So please enjoy today's episode with Sam Sedano. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Sedano, for being willing to be a guest on today's podcast. Thank you for having me and uh, wanting any information I can give you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like there's a lot of information. Um, this is, uh, at time of recording, we're a little bit farther in the future, but this is coming out the week of Ohio Star Ball 2020. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the history of Ohio and then obviously what um, you are doing this year that's different than past years, just in relation to it being 2020. So can you take me back to the start of Ohio Star Ball? What, what was the original inspiration and what did it ultimately became? Let me see. That would have been in 1978 or 77. I was much younger, had a lot more energy. <laughs> and, you know, I was always into organized parties. And I, I used to like organizing festivities. And me and this other person got together. There wasn't too many events running at the time. Uh, back in 1978, and we decided to run a one-day event for just the local, the tri-state, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan uh, area, and um, at that time, it was, the competition was only solo routines. We didn't have any freestyles like it is today, where you put so many people on the floor and you judge, so it was basically like a a one-day showcase, and then people liked it, and then the following year, we I, I don't know if we, I think we went to two days, and um, I think then we opened it up to freestyle events in, in uh, 1979 or whatever it was, and then um, it just kept growing and growing. I, I, I'm not like today's competitions where they start out as four days events to begin with. We started out as a one day event, then it went to two. When I felt we were ready, we went to three. And then for now we're at six. <laughs> it's a six day event. Do you think? So it's, you know, a lot of people say it's more like a dance festival mm -hmm. than a dance competition because there's so many events and styles of dancing that are being done. Uh, at the at presently at the Ohio Star Ball, so it grew into um, a very uh, versatile um, 
a comp that, that everyone would like to go to. Like right now it's a collegiate event, also a kids event, also a pro-am event. You know, it, it just, there's, actually I, I even want to open the comp to like West Coast swing events, all different styles of dancing. But um, the more variety, the better. And from there, it just took off. And I guess the love of dancing, uh, which is on my part, uh, and, and taking a lot of care into this competition, just people noticed it at the events and it grew and grew and grew. And it's always been one of the top competitions in the country. Uh, this year is a bit of a challenge <laughs> because of the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And um, we're trying to keep it safe and healthy. Mm -hmm. And the biggest thing that's that I want for this year is I don't want to have uh, some um, events that are going to cause um, a group gathering. Mm -hmm. Like before we used to, we used to, no, but before, last year, all the callbacks and the events used to be written on a blackboard and all the competitors used to go to this blackboard and look to see if their number is there. So this year we're not, we're doing away with the blackboard and the numbers are going to be seen on a screen, a projector, and then it's going to be on a screen. We're not going to have an on deck because uh, that's another gathering. Uh, as far as, well, there's one thing that we are doing that some people like it, some people don't. We're asking for a COVID test before you get to, to the event and to bring a, P, a certificate or a piece of paper saying that you were tested and that you were negative. And um, that seems to be doing well and some people not so well. <laughs> We're asking for masks to be worn all the time. While well, the minute you get into the hotel, the only places you, you don't have to wear a mask is when you're in your hotel room or on the dance floor. Because if you take your, the COVID, if you don't take the COVID test, you can't dance. Right. If you take the COVID test, you can dance. And so we will allow people to dance on the dance floor without masks. Okay. Some will still want to wear a mask, but that's okay. Right. Um, we, the, we have a, a lot of kids entries this year, but the, the great thing about Ohio is we have a great big venue and the kids events, which are on Friday and Saturday will be held in Patel Hall, which is a 50,000 oh, wow. square foot ballroom. And so all the kids events will be held in that room while all the pro-am adults will be hold, held in the Regency ballroom. Um, having different entrance and exits and uh, which way you can enter and which way you can leave and taking temperatures and um, before you go into the room, uh, trying to be as healthy as we can, um, you know, but like with, with, with this virus, you know, they could have a t test taken before they come to the comp. And if they're flying in, wh who's to say? Yeah. You know, you're on a plane, you're with people. By the time you get to the comp, who knows? Yeah. So it's just that we want the perfect environment for a competition today. And I think it's going to be a requirement because it looks like this virus is going to be going into 2021 is that people do take a COVID test because you just can't, if it keeps increasing and it doesn't disappear until a vaccine comes, people are not going to feel safe to go to an event. Mm -hmm. And until they feel safe, so the best thing we can do is even those people are saying, well, the COVID test is this, the COVID test, it could be a false negative, positive. Who knows? We're just trying to be safe. And like I always say, a perfect world with that everyone in the room be of negative. Yep. But once they leave it and go home, who knows right. what's going to happen. Right. But as long as we feel that at the comp, they're safe and it's a healthy environment. Um, yeah, things have, have, have really, really changed for this year. It is a challenge. Uh, I always like challenges and because uh, it makes my brain work. And so, I mean, the entries are, are, are very good. We have over 
right at the moment, over 9,000 entries. That's amazing. So, uh, yeah, so people want to go. Yeah. <laughs> they want to get out. They want to dance. You know, but you, you know, I know there are a lot of people who are, you know, who aren't coming because of, you know, the fear mm -hmm. or they have a, an elderly at home like their mother or father or someone that they don't want to travel to and maybe whatever, catch something and bring it back home. I mean, it's all understandable. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't think we'd get this many entries, but, but we did. So, mm -hmm. um, like I said, my main goal is going to be, and if I see any groups forming, I'm going to have someone go break them up have it announced over the mic the bar which is the most popular spot at any comp but especially at the Ohio Star Bowl will not be open uh it's going to be closed because I feel that is that is a spot that forms groups and people let their guard down they take off their masks and they're talking face to face so that's a no-brainer um but other than that I mean and the, the hotel with We've been meeting with the hotel every week on Tuesday, and the hotel's not going to have any tables and chairs in the lobby or in areas in the hotel where groups can form. So if they want to, if they get, they want to eat, the the market stand is open. They there will be places to go get food, but if they want to eat, mm -hmm. they'll have to take it to their room. So, I mean, we're doing everything that's possible yeah. that, uh, th that we can. And well, that sounds fantastic. I, I guess we'll just have to. Yeah. I, and the vendors are on the second floor in a different area. So it's when you got, but when you have all the space we have, and we have a load of space, mm -hmm. I mean, and it's spacious that you don't, you know, I don't, no one's going to feel contained. No one's going to feel like they, uh, 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 they're on top of each other. So, right. which is a plus for the Ohio Star Bowl. Definitely, definitely. The the convention center that the Ohio Star Bowl is held in is just massive. I feel like you could easily get lost trying to walk through yeah, from it, the vendors it, it, area. It's a, a million-dollar project. It's all new. Yeah. And um, it's it's... Got a, it, it's a great venue because you know we're the only competition that on our big nights which are Friday and Saturday night that's when you know the pro events are on that the competition is taken in another venue which is Patel Hall I don't know of any other competition that has uh, two venues that you can you know during the day or during the week you have it in the hotel ballroom and then at night, you have it in a con convention center environment. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when you when you have all this uh, space, you might as well take adv advantage of it, especially nowadays. Definitely, definitely. And I think it's I think it's fantastic that um, you have decided to put all of those safety measures in effect. You know, um, even if there's questions or people have questions about the legitimacy of the testing, it still incentivizes people to take safety precautions leading up to getting the test done because they want to ensure that they're getting a negative test before they come to Ohio. So if that encourages folks to take the two yeah. weeks before to be a little bit more self-isolated, to wash their hands, to wear their masks, to do all of those wonderful safety things so that they can get a negative test, I think that's that's solving the problem that people are concerned about it creating, which is you're encouraging people to be as safe as well, possible. Can, I know we have a requirement of 72 hours. Mm -hmm. No, no, sorry, seven days, but I don't mind three days prior. I don't mm -hmm. mind the day before, as mm -hmm. long as you have the test and it reads um, negative. And at, at the latest date is that we will have a doctor on site Mm -hmm. For those who weren't able to take the test, they can take it on site. It's, uh, I don't know anything about these rapid tests. You can learn in 20 minutes if yeah. you're negative or positive. So, I mean, we're, we're doing our part. Yes. But, you know, you can, I don't know how safe you really, you only can be as safe as you can be. Yeah. I don't, I definitely don't want to see anyone get this disease. It's, 
uh, especially me. I, I mean, I'm of that age and I'm, I'm the underlining conditions. So these people have to realize that there are a lot of people like me in that room that can't afford to get this thing. <laughs> absolutely, so absolutely. We're gonna go into it with a positive attitude. Yeah, um, I know that you are um, very social at dance events, that you take it as an opportunity to really meet with people, check in with people, see how they're doing, be a part of their lives. Are you going to change how much floor time you're putting in on this year's Ohio as, as a result of wanting to try and be a little bit more safe? Or are you wanting to well, have it feel yeah. as normal as possible? Uh, as normal as possible. I mean, th there were four events, I think that I judged already. One was in Indianapolis, and there were three already in Columbus. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I was social. I mean, for me not to be social, you know, but, but it's not the same, you know, no huggy, huggy, kissy, kissy, uh, six feet apart. I mean, that, that's, that's understandable. Um, I even at one point, I just judged a competition where all the judges had a certain area to sit at. And I just went to one area where there was only me at this table. I didn't even realize what I was doing, but I guess, I was thinking safety, safety, safety. And, and so I didn't sit with, with the rest of the judges. But, you know, it's, it's very difficult not to be social at these events because, you know, you pass them in the hallway, you pass them in the ballroom. So I was, yeah, I was being social. Mm -hmm. I was taught going to their tables with my masks on, my mask, and with the proper distance, never went to the bar, uh, never was really in a group setting. So yeah, as, as long as yeah, I'm going to be as socially uh, as I can because I'm so safety minded. I've always been this way ever since I was a kid. Safety, safety, safety. You know, it was for me, I, you know, always eating the, the right foods, always taking care of my health. So it hasn't changed at all. And so now that we have this to face, like I said, it's a challenge. You got to face it the best you can. Thinking back on kind of the growth of Ohio Star Ball, um, you mentioned at the beginning that it started off as just kind of showcase, pro-am oriented one day, and then it built out from there. Do you think that the success of the Ohio Star Ball is really that you took it one year, one day at a time and built out rather than starting like you said, starting with these four day large competitions and then struggling to fill the ballroom with entries by trying to do too much too quickly. Well, you know, the, the thing with me is me and my partner, we, we never did. In 1978, God, I was so green. Um, making money was not my main, believe it or not, was not my main goal. I love dancing too much. And, you know, when I think of every, you know, here's a perfect example of when I was trying to get where I am today, when I was a kid, I was so enthralled in dancing that I, I didn't know what was going around me political wise. Uh, I see the news, like sometimes in the 1960s, what was being done. I said, I don't remember that. But what, once I started dancing in 1960, my whole life was built around dance, dance, dance. And, and, and I really didn't, my world was dancing. That's the best way I can say it. And um, uh, the one, I was always a, a, a people person. Every, even when I was in high school, we, I was on a kid's uh, show called the Clay Cole, like American Bandstand, but it was out of New Jersey at a Palisade amusement park. And um, this was the largest amusement park at that time. And, you know, we were on TV and, you know, we would take the bus, me and my partner, to the, the, the park to go onto the program. And people would ask us for our autograph and they would say, oh, we, we see you on TV every day. And uh, I don't know, I was just, I was people friendly and I was always very approachable. That's what people have told me. I'm approachable. I don't feel like I'm 
pushing people people away. And I had a knack, and don't ask me where I got this from, of remembering people's names. And I didn't know that was going to help me when I get older and get in a business where it was going to play an important part. Um, but I think the biggest thing, you know, today because of the Ohio Star Ball and other competitions, people see how much money that is. That, well, yes, it is a business. Okay, I didn't think of it as a business back in 1978. I just wanted party time, you know. So, but as it, it grew and people saw that this was a business and they could make money from it, uh, I can't even tell you what I made the first, this is what, 45 years I'm running this now? I can't even tell you what I made the first 25 years. It was, you know, that was not my goal. My goal was not how much money I made. Because, you know, first of all, when I started the Ohio Star Bowl, we used to keep the prices as, you know, nothing is cheap, but we used to try to keep as reasonable as possible. You know, we didn't want to gouge anyone. So it was, um, it was never about the money. And then as you get older, I, I still don't think of it as the money. But, I mean, it, it's, it's there. It is there. You do make it. But that's not, never been my main goal of how much, because it's like a lottery at a comp. You never know what kind of entries you're going to get. You don't know why. You can't really depend on an income at a competition. You can estimate what you think you're going to make mm. and then be disappointed or not. So uh, money was never the, the object. But I think today with these starting, when they see, they, they estimate what Ohio makes, what these big events make. Uh, they think, um, oh, there's money there. I wouldn't say this is all organizers because, mm -hmm. uh, but some of them do it for the, 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 the money. We all want to make money, but I think if we keep it um, at a normal sense, you know, and, and, and not try to overreact and uh, overcharge and uh, yeah, I, I just, want to be everything fair and normal. I want to dive a little bit deeper into that if I can. So um, in in your book, uh, it mentions that the early competitions or performances that you did with your students, um, specifically at the dance aramas with Arthur Murray, that you were not paid for those events as instructors, that you were really only paid for your time in the studio. And in addition to that, um, in order for you to teach for Arthur Murray, you had to go through their teaching program and get certified through their bronze program. And then you went on and actually got your ISTD certifications as well. Do you think that the business of dance sport has changed dance, the way that we interact with ballroom dance in a positive or negative way? Because you're right, it, it has become a lot about the money these days. Well, you know, when you're with, you know, being that I've, I, I've owned, I think, three or four Arthur Murray schools. Um, back when I started in 1960, I mean, well, I was 18, right out of high school. I mean, the, the fact that I could go to, to Las Vegas, to England, to Italy on all these trips for free. I mean, I didn't, you know, that, that, at the end, when, when you're 18 or 19, that's enough for money. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I'm getting all these trips, uh, which I wouldn't have been able to take. I used to say, join Arthur Murray, seeing the world, you know, because I, the first time I went to Blackpool was 1963 on a Arthur Murray's trip. And and at, the, at that time, here we go again, I didn't know what they were charging the students. Right. So I did not, I, I, back then, when I was 18, like I said, I, I mean, when I used to bring home a $50 paycheck, I used to think that was pretty big. <laughs> but uh, as long as I can live and make my bills, I was fine. But, you know, the trips, all the trips, I mean, I saw the world in the beginning. 
I mean, we, we went everywhere, Spain, the, you name it, we went. And as far as like, again, the money wasn't my main uh, thing uh, there. Today, it, it's, it's different. And I don't blame it, things have to change. They evolve, they, you know, people have to get paid. Uh, the hardest thing for me was when I was 16, 18 years old teaching, is you know you're always dealing with very wealthy people, and you see how much money they have, you know, and what they're. But but dance lessons back then were twelve dollars a lesson, <laughs> an hour, twelve bucks. I mean, I mean, of course things things change, but you know when my always belief was when you're always hanging around this wealth, you know the people with not everyone was that wealthy, but you know they they had this this money, you know, uh, you used to see the, how the better half lived. Mm. Not, that, not that I didn't, I always lived great. Um, I never deprived myself of anything. When I used to teach 40 lessons a week at Arthur Murray's, I used to have one meal a week where I'd go to this expensive restaurant and have a steak. I always used to treat myself for all these lessons I used to teach. Um, as far as when, the, my hardest thing was when I joined Arthur Murray's, all I did, I cared about was dancing. And I thought that when I was in the Arthur Murray studio, that's all people cared about. That when they came to the studio, it was about dancing. And the first time I learned that I've got to find out why they're there and what their, um, what's their motive is for being there, and, and I said, well, wh why? I said, they're here to learn how to dance. I love to dance. Why shouldn't they love to dance? And they said, no, 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 no. You got to find out why they're here. Do they want to make friends? Do they want to lose weight? Do they want it as an exercise? And the hardest part for me was changing my mind from, because before I went to Arthur Murray's in 1960, I went to, I used, I used to live 20 minutes from Broadway on the New Jersey side in New York. And I was wanted to be one of those chorus. So, so I went for lessons in New York and uh, jazz dancing and tap dancing and, and everything. But then when I realized that that wasn't gonna be for me, I saw this Arthur Murray sign where I lived and I just went in there. And, and, it, it, and it was dancing and I love dancing. So, uh, but the hardest thing for me was in the beginning was thinking that dancing was a business. How could, how could dancing be a business? I loved it, you know? I used to love to put, hear the music and dance and, and then I had to think, okay, I have to motivate someone to go on for, with lessons and go on and go on. And that was very hard for me to do. But I was successful because the love of dancing carried across to my students. They could see that, my energy, and it was all, it was, you know what I did say? I said, all right, when I came in and I was 17, what was my motive? If everyone ha has to have a motive, what was my motive at 17 to come in to learn how to dance? They said, oh, you wanted to be somebody. I said, that's a motive. I said, I was a somebody before I came in here. I was on a TV show. I was voted best dancer in my senior class. I said, I guess you're right. That's my motive. You know, <laughs> I want to be somebody in the dance world. But it takes a lot of work. And that's why I took all my tests. I studied. I, but you know, one thing you have to, one thing you learn is that it is a business. It's, 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 it's a business for me or professionals. It's not a business for students because it's either a hobby or it's a luxury. Mm -hmm. uh, but for, for, for people who are trying to make a living, it is a business. And sometimes people don't realize that when you go to a, a franchise school, okay, there are things that, are, that, that have to come, that a, a franchise school is obligated to uh, spend, like franchise fees and they have to pay. Yeah, the, whole, uh, the the rent, the staff, the taxes. So 
So all this has to uh, take place. So it's got to be considered a business. And I, it just can't be considered my hobby because my hobby wouldn't get me anywhere. It would get me the love of dancing and poor as I'm trying to meet my bills. But like I said, I never tried to gouge anyone. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and I, I think one of the best things for me, and I'm glad I started with Arthur Murray's because it taught me the business. It taught me how to deal with students and, and learn about them and, and that it was about them and not about me. Don't talk about your me all the time. Learn about them. You know, find out what their um, thing is. And, and I think that's what carried across in the year, this, even up to today. Why I can remember people's names. Why I'm, I'm not a, I am approachable because I like to know people. I like to meet new people all the time. I like to hear about people's, other people's lives and, and, uh, <laughs> and what they're doing and how they achieved to where they got. Uh, I'm, ju I'm just a, 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 a people person. Someone said to me one time, what, who's the guy, uh, uh Fields, uh, what's his name about it? he it was something about people that uh if it wasn't for people he wouldn't be where he is because mm. people made him what he is so it's well that's definitely what, what what's made me besides my talent for my dancing people have made have put me where i am and and i i only owe that on being fair being approachable being decent yeah. never taking advantage of anyone. I, can't, I, I I look back, you know, when I read the, wrote that book, not I didn't write it, I gave them the information for that book. There's so much history of my life in that book, and I can't think of one time that I actually did something to get ahead to step on somebody. Because I always knew it was gonna, in our business it was going to be hard work. Mm -hmm. That the only way I was going to make money is through my own hard work and I was never going to be left money <laughs> that if I wanted money, I was going to have to work for it. And um, that's the way I guess my whole life has been. So uh, that kind of goes along with a quote um, from when you were being honored at, well, it's now it's DBDC, but at the time it was DBD something. You mean it's important? Yes, yes. Your uh, whatever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I when when you were being honored these, it, in uh, twenty fourteen, you said um, that you wanted your legacy to be. I want to be known for being there for them, relating to how you make people in the ballroom feel and how you make people in the community feel. Why, with all of your accolades, with all of your dance related accomplishments? Why is that still the focus? What, what about relating to people and being a part of people's lives? Um, do you find fulfilling, important, worth focusing on? Well, you know, people, um, people's lives I find very interesting. Every person is different. Uh, sometimes I'll see a person at a comp and I don't know them from Adam, never met them that, but they're, they're there for the first time. And a year, maybe they stay, they stay in the business for a year and they, they continue to take lessons. And I get to know that person over the year and I get to hear w what makes them tick or I mean what, what the, like I'll, I'll very easily here's the best way I can say it I'm a person who will go up to a student or or whatever or even a teacher and tell them because I used to judge not anymore almost 40 competitions a year I used to almost be out on that floor judging every weekend. And I used to feel very obligated 
to judge that person at the moment and not maybe 10 weeks in a row of what I've seen them do. So I, I, I had it, it, it with my thinking, oh, instead of saying, oh, here's Joe Schmo, I know where I'm gonna put them. But I would, at the moment, I would study them. I would look at their dancing. I would see improvement. Then I would go over. It was a very great conversation piece. You go over and you tell them that, you know, I've seen you, you know, I've judged you all the time. I've seen you over the year. You have improved so much. You know, you, 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 your teachers, you know, how many times have you come in for lessons? Uh, you know, little, you know, being a judge is, is, is the best form of conversation because I'm not a judge who judges and goes off with the rest of the judges and hangs, okay? I'll hang with the pupils. I'll talk to them, okay? Um, I've been known, people said, well, why aren't you with your friend, your judge? I said, I see them all the time. I said, I'd, I'd rather be telling you of the improvement I'm seeing in you and that uh, I think you're going along the, along the right lines. And if I didn't think they were going along the right lines, I would be very, take a different approach, but I would, I'm not, I would never be negative. My goal was always to be positive, make the student feel good or the teacher. You know, lots of times people go on coaching lessons and they just belittle people and, and they make people cry. I mean, I've heard more stories like this and I don't understand that. Our job is not to do that. Our job is to, is to educate people, not to, uh, we know, yeah, we know what, 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 where their weak points are, but, but know how to approach it. Um, but with, 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 I like to see progress and I like to see people grow. I mean, I've seen people change their, their, their whole look over the years. I mean, I've seen students dance for 20 years almost three or four or five times a year, you know? So how can I divorce myself from that? How can I not say anything? How can I not even meet that person or know that person? I mean, if you see someone like, let, let's say 10 times a year and they're dancing 20 years, how can I not acknowledge it? I mean, there'd be something wrong with me, you know? And it's, it's so easy to remember people's names like that, you know, but, and, but it's, um, I, I like to see on the, people grow and people get better, but I also can't understand why when I see a lot of students, why they're not getting better also, you know, I'll see students that, like I said, same amount of time and they're not getting any better. And I wonder why, but it's not up to me to wonder why. I just hope that their teacher then their student and the student is in my group classes that sometimes we teach at competitions to learn my my knowledge. But you know, when when I go to competitions and I see a weakness in one of the styles, I I don't I usually feel that it's education because if they had the knowledge, I don't think they'd want to go out on the floor and look like that. So if they educate themselves, which I don't think too many do that, but you've got to be um, knowledgeable. And, and if you want to compete, you better be knowledgeable. If you want to be a winner, if, if you're that serious, you better educate yourself. And, and you know, it's, it's, that, that's not politics. If, 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 if you're good and, and I can tell right away if you're, you can tell a good dancer, they've been taught well. So I think ed education is, uh, you're always educating, I, I feel with me. You know, I'm always educating a young teacher. I'm always educating a top pro. I'm always educating a student for the first time that's come to a competition because the teacher will bring her over to me or him to me and say, this is their first time at a competition. Do you have any words of wisdom? <laughs> and I say, and my favorite thing is, you know, participation is the first step towards winning. I said, so if you participate, that's a, you know, you, that's a, a nudge in the right direction. I said, 
Don't ever think that participation is a losing thing. Even though you may not get the results you want when you participate, it's always a learning experience and a winning experience. And it's um, because when I used to go around to, I used to travel a lot for 20 years for the Arthur Merrick Studios and tell people why I thought that, you know, they, that they should take the next program or why they should stay with it or why, you know. Uh, and I always felt that when I went into a studio for the first time, I had to educate them on my beliefs. I had to educate them on my knowledge because without knowledge, without beliefs, I don't know what the heck you're educating. It's the same thing when I talk about these, when I'm teaching styles, whether it's rhythm, smooth, ballroom or Latin, if I don't have the knowledge to back up my teaching with, then how can I educate these people? I, I just don't, I sometimes I, 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 they say, well, once you're a judge, you can judge every style. Well, that's a good comment, but um, I, I believe that I've done every style that, that I'm, that's going on right now. So I've experienced it all. And um, education sometimes is very difficult. <laughs> in in your opinion, because I feel like ballroom dance um, straddles the line between sport and art form, and there's always kind of this battle of trying to figure out where the two intersect. Do you think, from an education standpoint, we are now reaching a point in our history with ballroom dancing where we need to reconsider formalized education? Or do you think, no, one of the benefits or one of the competitive aspects of the industry is not having a requirement for instructors to be certified or a formalized process to learn the steps and the syllabi and learn how to teach? Do you think it's a benefit that that's more, anybody can come in and open up the studio? Oh no, <laughs> no, I, again, I think the franchise schools, uh, and even the, even the independent world, there's a lot of independent organizations that uh, a lot of studios have, I mean, you know, once you leave a franchise school, because you're so involved with a franchise school and you feel so involved, you're included, that when you go to the independent world, you know, years ago, once you went independent, that was it. There were no other organizations that you could go to and learn their step list and learn what, what, what their beliefs are. But today it's changed. Today you have a lot of people who have left franchise and have opened studios, but follow a certain curriculum of, a, of an organization. And they have seminars and they have books and they have videotapes. I mean, today it, it's really easy to um, belong to something else because people want to belong. And, and, and so the thing is getting educated. At one point, if you didn't belong to a franchise school, you would think, oh my God, what do I do now? This was years ago. But now it's not like that. Now you, you, you can get education from, from anywhere. And, and I feel, <laughs> I don't know how this is going to go over. If you're going to ask for the professional rate that we're asking for, these students deserve a professional lesson, all right, from someone who is educated, who has knowledge. I'm not, if I'm hurting, I'm not gonna go to a doctor who I don't feel is knowledgeable or educated in my area of pain. You know, that's just, that's just you know, ridiculous. But the, the thing is, uh, Education, I keep, I keep calling every, everything education, that um, you have the serious competitor and you have the competitor who is just socially minded. Okay, now the serious, I would say the serious competitor is about 
Oh God, 15% of the, I always used to say in a dance studio, 15% of our student body are competitive minded. The rest just come in for a social atmosphere. When you, when you go to a comp, the serious, serious dancers, you know, the ones who want to be the champion of the world, I would say maybe are 10%. And, and, and may stick it out. You can always go by how a comp is doing by the lower levels, like the beginning levels, not because once you get higher, it, it gets thinner <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, but I, I, I feel that it's, if you're going to go to a comp, well, here's me. When I went to a competition, I had to be ready. I had to feel that my student was the best prepared, had the best costume, had the best routine, had the best structure, the technique. In order to be number one, you got to think like number one. But that was me. Not everyone wants to be number one. Not everyone wants to win. I do. And this was my product on the floor. This is always, every, every time I competed Pro-Am, my main goal was to win. And I used to say to my student, if you want a, ha a happy life coming into the dance studio, there's two ways you can go. You can go the competitive route or the medalist program and social life. Now, if you go to the competitive route, that's going to be more pressure because now you're my product and I'm taking it out on the floor. So how you look is because of me. And I'm not going to look like, but if you want to come in and learn your medalist, metal uh, steps and check out and do the metal program. I'm all for that too. So I used to let my students know my two forms of, uh, of teaching. And I, I used to live by that because first of all, I used to need teach students who didn't want to compete so that I can remember my own, <laughs> my own uh, figures from all the way to gold star. But it, it's, but I never took a, a competitor into a comp unless they were as serious as I was. It wasn't a joke with me and it's, it wasn't a joke with them. And we always won. I mean, we, we, we would, I mean, not always won, we would lose, but um, mostly we would, we would be on the, the winning side. But, you know, lots of times I go, when I'm judging competitions, I, I look at the, the student even before they take the floor and I go to the, in my mind, I'm saying, why did that teacher let his student wear that kind of costume? What was he thinking of? You know, I mean, they're starting off in, on a bad foot already. And then technically, hey, when I see someone dancing two or three years with the same bit weak structure, I don't know where they're coming from. You know, because I, I, I was never like that. You know, I could very easily... That's very easily see when they had no more education, any more knowledge to carry across. But that's why they go out and they get it. They take, see, years ago, believe it or not, when I competed with my students, we didn't do coaching lessons. Back in the 60s, it wasn't like it is today in 2020. Coaching lessons, take, bring someone in and, and have an eight-hour, 10-hour coaching day for the whole week, we forget it. I never had a, when I competed in the beginning, I never had a coaching lesson. And I could swear to that one, even though it's people, well, how did you get better? I got better because I studied, I took my exams. I, you know, that wasn't coaching with me and my student. I was personally getting better and it was coming off to my student. So, so it's, Good. <laughs> I was just going to say, so two things that I wanted to talk about in there. Um, the first is um, the impression that you have as a judge when you do see a pro-am couple hit the floor, and it's either very clear that the instructor has said to the student, you are my brand, you are my product, so I'm going to make sure that you are the best you could possibly be as a reflection of me when we hit up on the floor versus 
probably, oh, hey, this is a fun event. Let's just go and have fun and not worry about. <laughs> so Hi. Can, can you tell immediately? And does that and how does that impact the judging scores at the end of the day when you see the difference? Well, I've seen not only me, but we judges have seen some pretty horrendous. I mean, I've seen teachers take a floor with a student and be miserable. They don't crack a smile. They're not enjoying themselves. I mean, and the student is taking, a, you could tell she's doing a lot of entries. Mm -hmm. So, which means she must, she's a good student in that school. She's a, she, she's a good piece of business, whatever, however you want to say it. And what's going through my mind is what in the heck is he thinking? He's, he's dancing mean. He's dancing angry. And lots of times I don't do this because this is not my thing to go over and reprimand him. But there are judges who do do that. You know, many times you know, we make it a joke with some teachers we call it, well, here comes Joe show. He's doing a walk of doble. He's doing a walk of cha-cha, which means they're just walking through it, you know? Or the music starts in 10 seconds. He's either fixing something or doing something or, or whatever. And then he starts to dance, you know? So a lot of people will, will, will go over because unfortunately it does ref go reflect, the mark is going to reflect him, but it's the student that's getting it, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that's, it. but some of the judges will go over and say to this, what, what is wrong with you? Well, I did one time, you know, I, I like to create, like I created the World pro -Am Dance Board Series. I created the best of the best. Uh, me and another, me and Bill Sparks created the Fordney Foundation. So I love to be creative, creative. The collegiate, I didn't create, but I love the collegiate because I just love their energy. I just love what they bring onto the floor. You know, so um, this student was about to win the World Pro-Am top student of the year. And this happened to be the teacher that was a little bit angry all the time. Mm -hmm. And she never really was improving that much. So I went over to her and I said, you know, I don't do normally do this. I said, you know, but by the end of the year comes, I think you're going to win the top student. I said, and I really think that you should be working on this or this or that or that or this or this. And you should not for me, because I didn't live in her area. You should take some coaching lessons from people who can help you with this. Because I wouldn't want, you know, you're going to win the top student and for your own well-being and you're feeling good inside you want to feel like you earned it that you didn't just win it because of all the the entries you did you know it's it's very easy when um you 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 like the pro-am i always judge the student always and why i'm saying that is because what what happens sometimes is the student could be dancing with a, a real good instructor, like one of the, let's say one of the top six in the pro pro field, mm. you know, that's her teacher. All right. So, and then she goes out on the floor with a kid who was just maybe a year in the business. And of course there's a difference. One is experienced, one is not, you know, and I used to go to, here's your, here I am again. I would go to that inexperienced teacher and the student, because I knew they would be bummed out, even if they lost to someone who was deservingly. So I would say, listen, as you know, you know who I am, you know, I judge all these events. I have seen the couple you've lost to many years. Same teacher, same student. You, I haven't seen it all. So you're, I know you're fairly new. So don't get so down and out because it's, you could say it's unfair, but it's not unfair. It's just that you, you, you've got experience against a beginner. I said, and, and, and someday it's going to be the same thing. You, if, if it happens, you'll be that case. You'll be the experienced, and there'll be an inexperienced 
you know, whatever. Um, but sometimes, I mean, you could see the good teaching. I mean, it's, it's their, their frame is good. The way they move from foot to foot, the way the teacher is putting them there because he's so experienced. His body is so aware. It's carrying across to the student. So it's, um, for me, it's a no brainer. And, and especially when I judge, like I said, a lot, almost 40 times a year. It's, and I, and the thing with me is I, I get to know everyone. I know everyone, you know? And if you don't think that when I go to a comp that putting someone down all the time because of who they're dancing against, that's why I like to judge on the moment and maybe really give that person a good mark one week just because whatever. Mm. So anyway, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be a little selfish in this moment and ask a, a question that I will personally yeah. hopefully benefit from. But I also know that a lot of our listeners are also female instructors that are newer in the industry. You mentioned a couple of times the pro am experience from a male instructor, female student male. perspective, which is the majority of our industry. It's the majority of the couples that you see on the floor when you're judging. Specifically when it comes to a female instructor leading an amateur or following for an amateur gentleman on the dance floor, what is the biggest mistake that we are currently making that you wish we would fix? Or what is something that we are currently doing that you want to see more of from our students on the floor? Well, you know, first of all, yeah, someone gave me a, an exchange lesson one time. This is the best way I can put it. And it was with a man. Okay, and I was the woman. And she said, I want you to give him, I, I can't be in town this week so give this guy a coaching lesson all right it was international so I got out on the floor with him in my great frame and all of a sudden he took <laughs> this first step and I feel like I was being raped and I said I said to myself I said you know this is not is this the way you move with your teacher I said, or is this because you're dancing with me and I'm bigger than her or whatever? I said, because you had my legs everywhere. I said, I, 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 said, I was so uncomfortable. And when I got her, the teachers, when she came back, I said, how the hell did you do? You? I said, you look so good with him. On the, I would have never imagined that's the way he felt when you were dancing with him. And you see, and she said, well, that now you know what I go through. And, but my answer is this, with, with a female instructor, is that if you know what it feels like to be right, if you dance as, you know, with, with a, forget, with a pro, it doesn't have to be a partner, but a pro teacher in your school, if you know, when, when you're doing something, you got to know how it feels to be right in order to teach it. I mean, when I get it, if I, if I was a woman teacher and I wanted to move the way I wanted to move from foot to foot and I couldn't do it, then I'm going to have to fix him. I'm not going to adjust myself. I'm going to teach him how he should move so that I feel comfortable. Because if, if, if I get into dance position and all of a sudden... I'm ready to go and I feel great. And all of a sudden I can't do anything. Then I'm really not doing him a favor by just dragging him along or pulling him along. My, my thing is, and this is why I also say with male teachers, they should know what it feels like to do the girl's part right. Because how are they going to carry that across to the, to the, to the student? And what, what I feel with, with women, the women teachers, they have, a, we all have hard jobs, but when they have a, a person that doesn't move, the worst thing they can do, a female teacher, is pull them along because then they become like a Herculet. Their arms become strong. 
their bodies become tense. And meanwhile, he's not doing, he's really not learning how to move, how to really move his weight or how to do it right. So to masquerade him and to camouflage his weaknesses, when all you have to do is, you know what it feels like to be right? Get him to put you in those positions so that you feel right. If you feel like when you're moving backwards in the smooth dances and your ass is out and your legs are here and they're flying all over the place, that means his weight's not moving forward. You got to get his weight over the balls of his feet. For, for me, and especially with today with video and everything, it's so easy to, to look at the video and see, you see what you're doing? You see what, 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 what I have to do to compensate? I wouldn't know how to approach that, but if you see what I, I have to do to compensate what you're not doing, you know, but the, the biggest thing with, with women, when I'm judging the woman's uh, teacher and the male student, I can tell when the woman is really, well, the same with the male teacher. I can see when they're doing it all. When they're, when they're, ha the student is hanging on them and they're not doing what they should do. But I'll tell you, if I was a female, well, I know a, a, just an example for me for a male. When I was teaching a one-on-one -on -one male, and that, and, you know, the student would hang on me, you know, just for, you know, some of them were older and they didn't have balance. I used to go, you know, when I do this with my hand, mm -hmm. that means you're hanging on me. So yeah. get off of me or with this hand, yeah. you know, and, and the same thing with, with, with a female teacher, you got to have a signal to, to, to where, Hey, you're not doing, you're not moving the correct way. You're not, um, you're not making me feel right. Uh, a lot of times teachers and students have these little signals between each other with their hands. Mm -hmm. But, um, but I think the thing with the, with, with the women's, with the women teachers is if, 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 if I was a woman and I was a, knew what I wanted and it felt what I, I knew what, what felt right. I couldn't dance with, I have to teach him that way. I have to teach him so that I could do my part because it could be hell. <laughs> Are you, you pro, right? I am. Yeah. You teach. I do. Well, you know, yeah. It, and sometimes we compensate by just, uh, by trying to help them because, you know, a lot of times when you get a new student in the beginning years, I was always told, just get them moving. Yep. Just make them feel like they, they're moving. Let them make them feel like they're full of life. And yes, you start pushing and you start pulling just so they feel like, oh, I'm doing something. Wh which meanwhile, you know, down the road, it's going to be the complete opposite. Yep. And this is where the metal programs come in. You say you need 10 hours for this, 10 hours for that. Mm -hmm. But uh, my biggest thing is don't, you know, don't make your, don't drag, pull your student along. And I was never a pusher. If I had to push my student out of the way, forget it. They either carried their weight, got off that standing foot. Anyway, that's my belief. <laughs> no, I love that. I love that. Um, and you're right. I think um, especially with students that initially come in and say, I, I just want part of, I just want to be part of the fantasy, right? I want to learn how to dance. I want to have fun. I want to be social. And then six months in, they're like, oh, well, there's this competition coming up. Maybe we could possibly go do that. That sounds like fun. You do have this sudden shift of, okay, I was just getting you to dance for an hour a week and we were just having fun mm -hmm. and I was teaching you the basics and I was teaching the footwork, but I was doing a lot of the work to how do I now bridge the gap and talk about technique and talk about pushing off your standing leg and talk about it in a much more right. serious, fundamental way that doesn't scare you good. off? <laughs> An experienced teacher, like I used to, what I, you know, when I used to own the Arthur Murray School, I used to watch, the teacher didn't know, I used to watch some of the lessons going on. And one time I had this one male teacher teaching this female student and for a, a half hour, a half hour in front of the mirror with the student, they were doing, he was teaching her how to walk back to release the front toe and 
uh, drag the heel back. And I'm looking at this and I'm going, but that isn't fun. Right. This has got to be fun. You can't stay a whole half hour on something like that. You know, and this is where I think inexperience comes from. The inexperienced teacher will maybe do that where the, that's why we used to have a front department and a back department in, in schools. The front department took all the beginners and the back department took all the ones who were advanced. And, uh, but in the front department, you, you, it, was, it was supposed to be fun, easy. You, you, you can't uh, technique them to death. But, uh, and even when they, they move on and move on, oh, this is what I was gonna say. There comes a time where we, we as teachers we become, because we're critical, we're critical with ourselves, we're critical if we take a coaching lesson, because the coaches who's coaching us are critical with us, you know, they're saying what we're doing wrong all the time, and sometimes you never hear a good thing from a coach, and the same thing with a student, you got to tell them that they're doing a good job, and that everything isn't gloom and doom to them, and that's why when I at competitions, that's why I go at competitions and I, do, I go out of my way sometimes to tell that student how I think they've improved. Well, it's the truth. Mm -hmm. I say, you know, I really see a big in, improvement in you. And uh, I just want you to know, because you probably don't hear that too much. And everyone says, you're right. All we get is they criticize, they criticize. And I understand because mm -hmm. their teacher is seeing them all the time. So, but, but, but I think sometimes we forget that. And this is what I say to advanced students when they, they start getting too serious with this. I say, you know, I think we should go back to why you came in here. You know, because you, you're really going, you know, you're really going way out. You know, your placements are, are depressing you. You're, 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 you're this, you're that. You're, you're not liking anything. I think you got to remember why you came in here. It was going to be fun. It was going to be easy. It was going to be, and you know, competitions are supposed to be fun. And it's another way of improving your dancing quicker because they're immediate goals. But if it's not going to be fun, you, you're going to lose interest. You, you, you're not, who wants to spend this kind of money and this kind of time on something that is torturous or sadistic or depressive? So you, I think that we teachers, uh, have to remember that we have to be positive with the student. You, you, you got to, I mean, you got to be truthful, but you got to also tell the student what their weakness is. And you've got to know how much on a lesson to work on each. You can't technique them to death because the minute, you know, that teacher I was watching, I said, you know, when you work the half hour on that technique, why didn't you go into something fun then? Yeah. Why didn't you just dance them around the floor so that they get, get away from all this seriousness on releasing a toe and dragging a heel? You know, so, you know what? Sometimes we were our own worst enemy. I mean, don't forget that student. I always use this word all the time. Our student is, is a reflection of us. And what, 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 they're, we're, what they're doing is what we're, we're, they're getting it from us. Mm -hmm. So if I see a miserable student on the floor who's never cracking a smile, guess what? That means every week she goes in for a lesson, her teacher mustn't be doing that. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, I have found in my experience being a teacher that happened to enjoy dance, I feel like I'm, my mindset is very much I'm an educator first and a dancer second. Um, I can see differences when I'm in rooms with other instructors of individuals that really do focus on teaching their social students too much like how they were taught as amateur competitors. So they get wrapped in that technique, drills, push, you know, spend a whole 45 minutes on one topic and they lose the fun aspect of it. Um, Mm -hmm. Whereas I think someone that has more of that educator background 
at least in my experience, and it may just be me projecting my own experience on other people, listen to the students more and hopefully can tell when their student is like, I just came because I had a terrible day at work and I just want to dance for 45 minutes and we can worry about technique later. Um, I was wondering with your own experience when you were going through in your early years, did you, because there's a section in the book um, when you were working at, I think it was the Patterson Arthur Murray location. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. That you mentioned that you were having kind of a crisis of faith where you got into the business because you liked dancing and you wanted to dance and you were struggling with how do I teach dance when I really wanted to just dance myself? Well, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, yep, and I was, <laughs> and I was driving home from a Friday night party. I was, I, remember, I even remember my age. I was nineteen, and I was driving home, and it was after a Friday night party, you know, dancing with all these older people, you know, and. And I'm saying to myself, is this really what I want? I came in this to dance two years ago. And now I'm, I'm very far from that. You know, I, um, oh, I'm just becoming, oh, I hate to say this word, a gigolo. Okay, a uh, an, an escort, I and um, and I didn't like that. And that was not my my um, what's the word brand? Not my identification. Mm. I didn't want to be that. I was a dancer. Okay, and and, and I never forget driving home, and I'm, I was really going to quit, but then. <laughs> I realized that, you know, no one's, I, I got to do this for myself. You know, no one's going to help me. If I want to become a dancer, a better dancer, then Sam, go out and get it. Go out and, and that's when I, I, uh, I found this Fran Rogers and Dennis Rogers um, in New Jersey. Actually, they were the teachers that I replaced in Patterson, New Jersey, who went, they, they, you know, Diana McDonald, don't you? Not personally, you heard but of I, Diana I know McDonald? of, yeah. Oh yeah, well, that was her mother. That's how long ago this was. Diana wasn't even born. And uh, Fran was international and I wasn't. And I had heard that she was give, doing coaching lessons. This was 1962. And um, I said, you know, I'm gonna, you know, I, I've got to improve my dancing. I got to do something. I said, or else I'm going to feel like I'm not going anywhere. You know, and I didn't have a partner at the time. So I went over there and actually she became my partner. I'm the only one who took coaching lessons with certain coaches and wound up being their professional partner and competed with them. And <clears throat> so, uh, and then, I was always, what's the word, self-motivating? Uh, then I used to get, then I used to say, you know, all right, so I'm getting older students. I was never lucky to get an A student, you know, someone who was 16 or 18. It was either someone who was 70 and over, you know, but I didn't care because I felt that was going to make me a better teacher because I had never put anyone in a, um, uh, a bracket of this one's that age, that age, they're not going to learn. They're not going to be able to move. I used to teach everyone the same. But a lot of times with maybe someone younger, I used to, you know, this is funny because people would laugh at me. I would go dancing in the foxtrot or the waltz, and I'd look at myself when we, while I had my student in the mirror, making sure that I was standing right, my head was correct, you know, my arms were right. So I, I used almost a lot of lessons to educate me too, you know, to, to uh, because back then, 
we had the reel to reel. We didn't have videos. We didn't have, you know, it took forever to get them developed and then brought back. But um, so in, in essence, I used to make my, I always used to say this, my students became my dance partners until I found someone who was, you know, uh, I felt was the one I wanted to dance with. Mm. And then dancing with this woman, Fran, and we did wind up competing. We went to competitions. We didn't win, but it was a first step towards meeting my true dance partner. That's why I moved to Columbus, Ohio. And, um, but yeah, I went through that, that, that little de de depressed period where, you know, I said, if this is gonna be my dance life, every Friday night dancing you know, with students who, and just having fun, fun, social, social, you know, I said, that's not gonna be for me at 19. And then I had to think, change my thinking. I mean, in our business, I think, I used to always say, we become psychiatrists because we, we hear so many things that, we, <laughs> that they, and they want us to listen. They don't want us to talk. When you're in a franchise school, one thing I did learn, listen, don't talk about yourself. Listen, listen to that student. Okay, so I'd listen and listen and listen. You don't talk about yourself. Yet there were those who would come in, teachers, and talk to the student about their garden and what they cook, you know. But it would, that was never me. And I think, um, so, it, so in the, in the beginning, uh, if it wasn't for me self-motivating myself and wanting to be as good as I can be, because back then there was no, there was no fame in it in the 60s. There was no real money in it. There was no fame. It had to be love mm -hmm. for the dancing. And that's, that's what I loved. And the fact that um, I always called it the closest thing to Hollywood. When, when I would go to competitions and we'd all be dolled up and dressed up, this is the closest thing to Hollywood. You know, the, our fantasy world. You know, the, the world that I was always taught that when a student comes through the doors of a dance studio, I, they should be coming into a different world and then leaving this world. Because, you know, I used to always say to one of my franchise, my boss, why don't we ever have magazines in this studio or newspapers hanging around? She goes, I don't want these students to know what the outside world is. She says, when they come in here, I want them, this is their world. It's a fantasy world. It's fun. It's, I don't want them to bring the, uh, the outside world into this. And, you know, and in the beginning, I didn't understand any of this. But as you get older, she's right. They were all right. Their experiences led to, you know, led them to believe all this and, and it and made them successful. So, but one thing I did learn about myself, if you want to be successful, no one's going to do it for you. That, that I learned a long time ago. You got to be your own inspiration, your own motivation, your own, you want lessons and you want money, then you better teach more. And, and make more money. No one's going to give it to you. No one ever gave me a dime for my dancing lessons, except my father who gave me a deposit in 1960 when he said, Sam, a car or dance lessons? And I said, dance lessons. That's in the book. But, <laughs> but like I said, you know, you can't wait. The other thing, you can't wait around and, and, and wait for things to happen because they're not, they may never happen. Especially if you're, especially if you're in a dance studio that is business minded, then, you know, it's not going to be all about you and your dancing. It's not going to, they got to get the rent. They got to get payroll. They got to get, so if you want to be uh, whatever you want to be in the dancing, you got to go get it. Okay. <laughs> I, I have I have one last question for you, and then uh, I have a feeling we'll need to schedule another podcast episode because there is so much that we did not get a chance to dive into today that I I want to talk I about at a future date. <laughs> no, it's great. It's great. Um, on that last thought, how important in your own experience and in the dancers that you've watched be successful or not be successful? 
over the years, how important is it to find the right studio space for you and for your goals? Because you talk about in the book, um, making the move out of Patterson to the next studio, which I've already forgotten the name of, I apologize. Um, and that that was, and that in Trenton, you kind of like found your groove and that, aha, the world just kind of opened up. And that experience, you kind of credit in the book to leading then to traveling more and becoming more well-known and ultimately ending up in Columbus. So how important in your experience was it to find the right studio at the right time to foster your goals? Uh, First of all, the, the two schools I started in, one was Union City, New Jersey, And then I went to Patterson. They were actually just socially minded. We never went to dance competitions and we never went to dance dramas. So I would say from 19, well, it was only two years, 1960, 61, 62, three years. uh, The competitions weren't even in the scene until I got an offer from this guy in Trenton who was very much into dance dramas, very much into competitions, very much, in, and he had, they just won the dance drama as top studio and he was looking for teachers. And so I went down, I applied and I, and he said, you know, one of the things it's funny, I can remember all these 50 something years ago. There's certain things you can just remember. And he said to me, in order to come to work for me, you're gonna have to be able to choreograph routines to music. And now at that time, uh, there was no group competitions. Mm-hmm. It was all solos, okay, competitions. And I said, I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. He said, well, that unfortunately, is one of the qualifications that you got students, you pick a record, you choreograph to it. And I said, oh, I said, okay, I'll try. (laughs) So anyway, me and my friend moved there. And the more, and then I, but then I had competition students when I moved to Trenton. The first two, the first two studios I was at, I didn't have them, but when I moved to this one student in Trenton and they had fairly decent students that they turned over to me. And believe it or not, don't ask me, I picked the music and I choreographed to the music and one top teacher and we've still won top studio. And people, at that time, people were following, uh, they'd, go, they'd go to dance ceramics and there'd be like five ballrooms running at one time because that's all they did was solos. And wherever Sam Sedano was with his student is where all the people would go because I was, so going from, I didn't think I could do this to being a champion in this kind of field was, you know, I felt that it gave me no choice. I had to do it. I wanted to move. I was still young. So, and then from, then the then group competition came in. And I'll never forget this. See, I don't like change that much. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But when the groups dancing came, I said, oh, group dancing is going to be popular. Students want to go out there and dance a solo, be the sole presentation. You know, they're not going to want to go out with 13 other couples. And well, little did I know, that became the thing. (laughs) So it just... You know, I had to do a lot of brain searching too, you know, because change was not always, I mean, you know, I, I just one story that that's, I had to be very positive and I had to be um, very motivated or whatever you call to be successful. Because the first year I was in Union City, New Jersey, I was a student, a pro-am student. And I went through my bronze and I went through my silver in one year, and then Vietnam broke out, and 
All the teachers were drafted, but not me, because I was too young at the time. And so they needed me to take the advanced students. And some of them didn't want me, some of them did. But anyway, um, one day I go up to the school to teach at night because I was part-time in Union City. All the furniture's gone. Everything is gone. It's an empty uh, room. Nothing in the room except this big sign on the, uh, on the wall saying, good luck to whatever you do. That's how I was told the school closed. Mm. Okay. So I knew the manager's phone number. So I called her. I said, what the hell? What is this? What am I supposed to do? She said, oh, this is the way it was broken to me. She said, well, you got an interview at the Patterson, New Jersey studio. I said, oh, I said, well, who's, what made you think I'd want to go to Patterson? I said, then what is this with this big sign on the wall? Good luck. You know, well, anyway, off I went to Patterson. And so I had to really be motivated to, to carry on because th just at, at that time I could have thought what a flake this business is and, and to get released that way you know and then to Patterson and Trenton and then I moved to Columbus Ohio and that was that was the, really the start of of uh, everything but uh, uh, it's it's I don't know that's it <laughs> Fair enough. Well, thank you again so much for being a guest on today's podcast episode. There is so much more that I want to talk about, but we'll save that for a future episode, hopefully. Yeah, you could. I will. Um, and thank you. I, I, I enjoy doing this. And you're pleasant. You're positive. You're not digging for anything. <laughs> you, you're what uh, an interviewer should be like, you know. You let us talk. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate that so very much. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And so best... if you want to carry on, just let me know. Yeah, well, we will set it up. Um, and best wishes and congratulations on what I am sure will be an amazing Ohio Star Ball this year. I cannot wait to see. Um... Oh, yeah. I'm doing. Yes. God bless. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be safe. That's all I can say. Excellent. Thank you again to Sam Sedano for being a guest on today's podcast episode. If you would like to follow the Ohio Star Ball, or if you are interested in finding out more about the book that we mentioned, A Passionate Journey, you can do so using the links in the description box below. I'm Samantha. I'm your host with Love Live Dance. You can find this and all of our podcast episodes at ballroomchat.com, and you can find us across social media at Ballroom Chat. As always, stay safe, stay positive, and we hope to see you dancing very soon.